Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us and particularly for finding the room. <laughs> uh, my name is Catherine Rhodes. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk and I'd like to welcome you to uh, what is the second in our Blavatnik Public Lecture Series of this term. I would also just, just to take the opportunity to advertise the next couple of lectures that are coming up in the series uh, before I introduce today's speaker. So in about three weeks time, two, three, two, three weeks time, we, on the 18th of November, we have Greta Helena Egan, and she is head of the Global Seed Bank at Svalbard, um, and has a particular interest in, the, obviously, the food security dimensions um, of sustaining society, but also in the management of genetic resources. And then next March, we have Rachel Bronson, who's the president of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and that will be shortly after they have reset uh, the clock, the doomsday clock, so there may be some interesting questions to be answered there. Um, great. Both of those, if you want to sign up, you can do through, so through our website. Uh, to introduce today's speaker, um, Sia Mayan is co-director of Princeton University's programme on science and global security and has particular research interests in nuclear arms control and disarmament um, and in international peace and security and is concentrating, I think, at the moment on implementation of the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. I'm sure he will tell you much more about what he's up to. Um, so I won't take much longer. Um, Sia will speak to her for about 30 to 40 minutes before we have some discussion. Um, I'm told the acoustics in this room are very good, but obviously if you are struggling to hear, please move forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and speak and talk about some of the things that uh, keep me up. And I know there are people here who have many reasons that keep them up at night. But let me, if not add one, give you you know a slightly different texture to at least one of those reasons. And so um, I work mostly on nuclear weapons and related issues, uh, and have done so for the. 20-plus uh, years that I've been at Princeton. So um, what I want to do in today's talk is to um, partly explain to you how we got to where we are um, and explain why, from the very beginning of the nuclear age, we've always known the danger we're putting ourselves and humankind into. Uh, so unlike climate change and other things where there's a kind of learning process and a kind of uncertainty about some of the outcomes. With this, a case could be made that from a very, very early stage, people who are the kind of people we would want to understand the scale of danger that humankind faces, they knew and we did it anyway, which is not a very encouraging thought, but at least it's we should be honest about it. And the second part of the talk is actually about where we are today and some of the insights that we have about uh, the scale and consequences of uh, present arsenals and uh, their impacts. And then to talk about how what we had thought of as structures of governance, restraint and control that may help us manage the risk that we've been long recognizing have also come undone. So it's not just that we knew the danger and did it anyway, that when we tried to manage the danger, we set aside those structures of management also. So in a funny sort of way, we're in this kind of place where we know the danger and it's almost as if we've given up on trying to, to deal with it because it's been around for such a long time. And so, and I'll end with one hopeful optimistic note, which is the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, which is still at a very early stage and then uh, we'll have a conversation about what some of this may or may not mean going forward. So, um, the title, uh, The Conceivable Horizon of Horror, um, is, uh, will become clear in a minute. The story begins, it can begin in many places, but let me begin here with um, this, uh, since I'm a physicist in part and there are other physicists in the room, even before, years before the first nuclear weapon was actually ever designed, built, tested, or used, it was possible to understand its possibilities in quite significant scientifically informed detail. So in 1940, two um, refugee physicists at the University of Birmingham, um, Frisch and Pills, wrote a memorandum to the British government on the it was called on the construction of a super bomb, 
in which they took what were then recently published ideas in the physics literature about uh, a fission chain reaction where the fission of certain heavy nuclei was shown to, to take place, that the, you could actually then use that to think about what would it would take to make a nuclear weapon on this physical principle. And so because you knew the amount of energy that might be released from these fissioning events, you could calculate how much uh, destructive power might become available. And the first conclusion they reached was that you could make um, a nuclear weapon using this ice, rare isotope of uranium, uranium-235. Um, and the problem was that we didn't know how to separate uranium-235 from the much more abundant uranium-238 isotope, but they took for granted that, you know, if we could do that, then you could have this fast fission chain reaction. Um, and that if you had five kilograms of this, you could actually release the energy equivalent to several thousand tons of dynamite. And so to just give you a perspective, I mean, bombs at that time were of the order of tons. So you're talking about a scaling factor of more or less a thousand in destructive power um, for a bomb, not in terms of you know, kilogram for kilogram. But because of the scale of energy released, it, it became clear that you know you were going to have devastating consequences, and it is interesting that in March 1940, I mean World War II has just broken out. We haven't had large-scale city bombing yet, um, which you know increases um, later on in the war. But the example they give of, is using it against a city, and they they show that it would destroy most of a, a large modern city, and they also predict radioactive fallout as an inevitable consequence of uh, using one of these weapons. And so they say that you know, this bomb would be practically irresistible. And that because of the fallout being dependent on wind direction, that it would be hard to imagine using it without killing large numbers of civilians. And so nuclear weapons and city killing are seen as fundamentally connected from the very beginning. Um, they have a very interesting kind of uh, note at the end that because of this concern about the humanitarian consequence of using nuclear weapons against cities, killing large numbers of civilians, they said it may not be suitable as a weapon for use by this country, this country being Britain at that time. Um, but from this moment onwards, anybody that launched a nuclear weapons program and had physicists to do the, the design work and to figure out how to separate uranium-235 could have done a similar analysis. So by the time we're launching nuclear weapon programs, we know that this is one outcome that is possible from the project that begins. And so this memorandum is eventually shared with the United States and the Manhattan Project is born in knowledge that this is where you know, it's possible to, to go. It becomes even more vivid that this is not just some two scientists and perhaps a few policymakers, that when President Truman was first told about nuclear weapons. This is President Roosevelt authorizes the Manhattan Project. And President Truman, who was then vice president, was not actually told about the atomic bomb program, even though he's vice president of the United States. So when he became president, uh, one of the first things that happened was that the Secretary of War, what we would now call the Secretary of Defense, um, went to see him to explain the Manhattan Project. And so Henry Stimson writes in his diaries, and you can actually see the diary entries now, about exactly the date and the time that he briefed the President of the United States for the first time about nuclear weapons. So it's April 25th, uh, 25th, 1945, between noon and 1245. That's when Truman is told that this is what we've been doing. And he says that you know, in a few months, the bomb will be ready. It was actually ready and tested in July. And Truman's memo, which you can read, um, says this is going to be the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. No illusion, have no illusions. And that the world would be at the mercy of this weapon and that modern civilization might be completely destroyed. Now, you can't get clearer than that in terms of telling the president that this is what we've been doing. You should know these are the consequences. I mean, Truman could have said, oh my God, we have to stop. But that was not something that happened. And what the US tested it and then used nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But 
this shadow that is cast that the highest level of policymakers involved in that process knew exactly then the scale of uh, the process that was unleashed. And it wasn't just them. The first nuclear test that takes place in July of 1945 in New Mexico, um, the physicist I.I. Rabi, who's actually there watching the test, wrote a very compelling description of that first nuclear explosion. And And he writes in it that, that you know, this new power represents a threat not only to mankind, but to all forms of life, right? and that nothing is immune. So this kind of um, fundamental rethink about what is now at stake in the nuclear age is there from the very beginning, um, both in detail and in uh, this kind of people's sensibility. And this only gets more heightened with the coming of thermonuclear weapons. That when the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear weapon in 1949, the United States government asked its Atomic Energy Commission Scientific Advisory Board, which is chaired by Robert Oppenheimer, who led the Manhattan Project, that should the United States build the even more powerful possible thermonuclear weapons, what we would call hydrogen bombs. So a group of very distinguished Manhattan Project physicists were tasked to assess this possibility and write about it. And the um, report says, we should not do this. Right? And there is a minority report that doesn't say we should do this, that it's even more categorical that we shouldn't do this. And one of the things that they said was that uh, they worry about the global effects of these weapons and the radioactivity that's generated, and that there is no limit to the destructive power, and especially the concern about the radioactivity that follows. But their report is ignored, and the US launches thermonuclear weapon program, and the first thermonuclear weapons start to be tested in the 1950s. And so throughout the first decade and a half of the nuclear weapons age, it's clear that there is a growing realization of the scale of what is being put into play. And so there are people who say this is not a good idea and do so publicly. And um, I, I show this slide in part because um, it is actually important to recognize that you know, it wasn't just scientists warning policymakers and writing reports and writing memoirs, but they took action. And you know, Einstein was very prominent as an outspoken critic of, of nuclear weapons, and, uh, but also as an activist and an organizer. And so in 1946, he is led to form the Emergency Committee of the Atomic Scientists. And so this idea that we are in, a, in an emergency and that this is a global emergency that requires this kind of action. And the address is 19 Nassau Street, which is down the street from my office. So I'm very pleased with that. Um, it's one of the first uh, interventions that the physicists make publicly uh, to kind of connect uh, their role to the policy making process democratically rather than through directly talking to policymakers. And Einstein's letter, which is a fundraising letter in 1946, asking for a million dollars to physicists all over the world, send money. We need to um, educate the public about the dangers of nuclear weapons. And that the presumption was that there is a, a democratic responsibility that falls upon scientists to uh, explain to fellow citizens uh, what this means. And he says that it is through this notion of citizenship and responsibility that this is our only security and our only hope. Right? So it's not on the enlightened policymaker. It is through mass collective engagement. And he talks about that an informed citizenry will act for life and not for death. Um, so that was the hope. that, And so they did try. And it wasn't just Einstein. There, you know, there were others. And so in the early 1950s, there was a famous meeting in Princeton with Niels Bohr, James Frank, Einstein, I.I. Rabi, um, thinking about you know, how do we take this kind of agenda forward. And Niels Bohr, again, was an outspoken uh, voice on the dangers of nuclear weapons, warning in particular that because of what these weapons meant in the world as it was constituted of warring nation states, that we were in danger that this would become a perpetual menace, not just a global menace, but a perpetual menace. So this is echoing what Stimson told Truman, that modern civilization may forever be imperiled. 
And Bohr is telling the new United Nations exactly the same thing, that you know, this is going to be a perpetual menace. And so the very first resolution ever passed by the United Nations General Assembly, Resolution 1, January 1946, actually called, before the United Nations has agreed even all of its rules of procedure, or what are going to be the accepted working languages of the United Nations. Resolution 1 calls for a plan for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And it has always been astonishing to me that given the devastation of World War II, entire countries, you know, most of Western Europe, Eastern Europe laid waste, uh, large parts of Russia and Japan, that the first order of business is dealing with nuclear weapons. Then dealing, you know, re refugees, reconstruction, all of that. You know, I, I was given uh, due attention later on, but the first goal, the first challenge, is because they see the possibility that future wars may be even worse than the war we just had. But with the coming of thermonuclear weapons and the arms race, um, there is large-scale testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere and in the oceans above ground, um, which does release large amounts of radioactive fallout. So it wasn't just in wartime that we started to see some of the consequences of radioactivity on people um, and nature that um, had been warned about by Frisch and Pearls earlier on. And so now there are people who talk about using the beginnings of nuclear weapons testing as marking the beginning of the Anthropocene, that this is one signal that you can basically find almost everywhere in the world because of the levels of radioactivity that were released in a very short time space and have left an enduring mark. And so this is the, some people have argued that this should be the golden spike that you use to say, this is the beginning of the age where man, humankind made a clear categorical, you know, undeniable global impact on the planet. You can mark it as a stratigraphic layer because this is where all these radionuclides that come from fission and fusion reactions, this is where they are. And the scale of the damage um, was also understood you know, relatively early on. So the Soviet thermonuclear weapon designer and physicist Andrei Sekharov actually did an estimate in 1958. Other people did their own estimates around the same time about they knew the relationship between radioactive exposure and cancer. And so Sakharov looked at carbon-14 produced in nuclear explosions and calculated that for every one megaton of nuclear yield, you would produce so much carbon-14 and the radiation exposure of that carbon-14 as it enters uh, uh, the biosphere uh, would cause cancer in about 10,000 people. And when you look at the cumulative amount of nuclear testing that have taken place in the atmosphere, because when it's underground, most of the radionuclides stay underground, the, the testing, there have been over 500 atmospheric nuclear tests by the US, Russia, Britain, France, China, and one possibly by Israel in 1979. Total yield is estimated at roughly 545 megatons. You can do the arithmetic. And it comes to about five and a half million people. Right? And this is without war. But given the th levels of cancer worldwide, this is lost over the long period of time that it takes for all of this process to work out. And I won't talk about the local contaminations that take place, but we did this and it's largely unattributable in the sense that you can say it's these countries' nuclear weapons tests that did it, but you can't say this set of cancers was caused by the US test, the Russian test, the British test you wouldn't necessarily see all of those cancers in the background of other cancers, but there was no question that people understood the scale of the impact that was being had. And when you redo the numbers using modern estimates of the connection between radiation exposure and cancer rates, this more or less holds up. So this is one of the most clear um, articulations of, and this is where I, I begin to transition, um, that by the 1960s, people in very high levels of the US government and elsewhere uh, understand now where we've reached. So this is basically two decades into the nuclear age. So in 1968, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense from uh, the beginning of the 1960s with President Kennedy through to um, 1968, he says that he gives a speech to some correspondents in which he says, you know, with great clarity, um, that you know, there is this conceivable horizon of horror. 
that will dwarf any catastrophe that has befallen man in its more than one million years on Earth. And this is a kind of epical perspective that he offers. And that this is just, in, in, we've done this in 20 years, right? That I've come to this conclusion. And that every future age will be this atomic age, because we've done this now. There's no undoing it. And that if humankind is to have a future at all, it will have to be overshadowed with a permanent possibility of thermonuclear holocaust. So that's why it's forever end times. But this, we know that this is where it's at. And about that fact, we are no longer free. So there is a kind of fatalism that sets in, right? That it's going to be like this forever. The scale of what he calls this conceivable horizon of horror, we're always going to have to live with that on our horizon. And this sense of fatalism is in part one reason why at the time that McNamara is making his speech, the United States has now gone from one or two nuclear weapons in 1945 to 30,000 nuclear weapons by 1968-1969. And the Cold War seems like it is now an enduring fact of world order for the foreseeable if not indefinite future. And this is also where the United States and the Soviet Union begin to accept that they have some degree of strategic parity, that there is equilibrium, and that therefore you are by default going to have to coexist or mutually annihilate each other. And the two things then coexist, that the threat of mutual annihilation and the practice of coexistence go hand in hand from that moment. But what, we, what happened in the seven decades rather than the first two decades of, of nuclear weapons is that there was a lot of nuclear weapon testing. Nuclear weapons technology evolved a great deal. So um, the picture there um, on your left is the very first atomic bomb device, which was tested in July of 1945 with a yield of the order of 20 kilotons, 20,000 tons of TNT. And what is um, on your right is uh, a, US, a modern US cruise missile warhead just to give you a sense of the scale of you know, miniaturization that has taken place. And this is a two-stage thermonuclear weapon with a yield that is potentially um, you know, 10 times uh, what one would have got uh, from Hiroshima. And one can put multiple warheads on single missiles. Uh, but it's taken a lot of nuclear weapons testing uh, to do that. But and you know, as I mentioned in this slide, the United States has done a thousand nuclear weapon tests. But what we do know is that you can actually get two fairly compact thermonuclear weapons with, in today's world with as few as six nuclear weapon tests. So this is what we believe to be North Korea's uh, thermonuclear weapon. Uh, it's tested in 2017. And they've only done six tests that we know of. So they've gone from having no nuclear weapons to testing the first prototype weapon to advancing their weapon design to having what they suggest is actually a, a fieldable nuclear weapon in six nuclear weapon tests, which is, and basically this is done in a period of basically a decade. So if you want a, a simple measure, we've come from the Manhattan Project requiring a large portion of, you know, scientific capabilities and industrial capabilities. And the scientific capabilities were drawn from many, many countries, um, diaspora scientists and exiles and refugees, as well as those from the US, uh, and a huge commitment of resources to something that what many people would understand to be a relatively poor scientifically and technologically constrained uh, country with limited access to the outside world is able to do, you know, basically in a decade or so um, and have this kind of capability with a yield that is comparable to that of modern US nuclear weapons of the 100 uh, kiloton range. So this is what's inside. This is the schematic of a modern thermonuclear warhead. Um, it's basically two bombs, a simple fission weapon and a, a second stage, which is a thermonuclear weapon. And they rely on these, the same fissile materials that were first used during the Manhattan Project, highly enriched uranium, which was the core of the bomb that was used on Hiroshima, and plutonium, which was the core of the weapon used on Nagasaki. Uh, but this is used to drive fusion in, in a secondary device. And it's kilogram quantities of these materials that are used in nuclear weapons. And in the 70 years of the nuclear age, not only have we had the capability of countries to make nuclear weapons uh, spread in many ways, 
um, and the kinds of weapons they can make uh, in a relatively short crash program. But also, um, we've accumulated vast global stockpile of uh, nuclear weapon material. So I don't know how well it shows up in the, uh, the, the illumination here, but we've, one of the things we do at Princeton is try to estimate how much nuclear weapon material different countries have. And our estimate for now is that there is about 1,850 tons of this material worldwide, and it's enough for 240,000 simple nuclear weapons. So this includes material that is in weapons, materials that is reserved for possibly making weapons, material that used to be in weapons and has been set aside, and some materials produced in civilian programs that could be weaponized. And 99% of this material is actually held by the, uh, the nuclear weapon states, mostly by the United States and Russia. But um, the flip side of seeing this is that 1,850 tons would fit inside this room. So in terms of material, it's actually a manageable you know, a problem. It's not as if it would you know, take over uh, vast resources to, to control and, and manage this. It's a, as a physical uh, material object, uh, it's actually, there's a lot of it, but it's, uh, it's within manageable range. And just in terms of the, the number of weapons, the number of weapons has gone went up to over 70,000 and has now come down to where we are now with of the order of about 10,000 nuclear weapons worldwide. Um, but there are um, lots of nuclear weapons that are under various kinds of uh, accounting schemes and monitoring schemes as part of arms control treaties in the US and Russia, but very much larger numbers that are not part of any restraint or accounting regime um, in either of those countries or anybody else. But one thing that you can see when you try and look at it uh, over time is that the rate of decline of nuclear arsenals has basically plateaued. Right? There was a quite rapid decline um, during the 90s and the 2000s, but um, it's now basically flat. Um, and the reductions that are taking, that have been taking place now may actually be coming to an end, and I'll come to that in a minute. So just to, people always ask this question, so who has how many, since, you know, it's, uh, for some countries it's a secret. The U.S. has actually publicly declared exactly how many nuclear weapons it has. Um, uh, to some extent, so has Britain um, and France, but there are upper limits, not uh, always precise ones of how many in what category, but by and large um, the range is now from a few tens in the case of North Korea to of the order of 6,000 held by the United States and Russia. And one thing that becomes very clear is that um, we still have these giant legacy arsenals left from the Cold War of the US and Russia and that Britain, France, China, the UK, Pakistan, uh, India, Israel, North Korea, um, you know, are of a second order. And the idea that China is going to become involved in arms control treaty negotiations with Russia or China when they have 3,000 and the Russians and the Chinese have kind of, uh, Russians and the Americans have about 6,000 each, kind of, you can imagine the Chinese saying, yeah, okay, we'll have an agreement. We won't make any more if you reduce to 300, right? And that's not, something that one imagines the US and Russia being willing to put on the table. So it's very hard to see how this particular part of the dilemma is going to be uh, resolved until the US and Russia come down to much lower numbers. And that's the process that has now started to unravel. Um, war planning, right, was always a central element of this. It's not that you know your nuclear weapon just sits there and, and doesn't do anything. Um, we know the most about US nuclear war plans because a lot of this material has been declassified. Um, so back in the 60s, when they tried to set rational ceilings for how many nuclear weapons the United States had had, Robert McNamara came up with a simple calculation, which was that, you know, what does it take to deter? And the answer was, you know, how much do I have to hurt you? And he says it's reasonable to assume, and I I've never managed to kind of convince myself this is reasonable, but that to, to destroy 25% of 
the Soviet population, which was then 55 million people, and two thirds of its industrial capacity would mean the destruction of the Soviet Union as a national society. So we've gone from killing cities to killing countries. Right? The bomb will kill a city, your arsenal is designed to kill a country. And that if you can reliably kill a country under any possible condition, including after you have been attacked by nuclear weapons yourself, you need to have enough left over reliably to do this to the other side, then that should be enough of a deterrent to maintain uh, some degree of stability. So that was his, his calculus, um, that that's what it would require. And in his new memoir, The Doomsday Machine, Daniel Ellsberg um, tells this absolutely amazing story where he was um, uh, in the Kennedy White House in 1961 and he was the first civilian to see the US nuclear war plan. And the civilians include the President of the United States. So Ellsberg sees the war plan and he convinces the White House to have President Kennedy ask the US military how many people would die if we carried out our nuclear war plan, which the President has not seen. So they say, okay, so Ellsberg is tasked to write the question which Kennedy signs that goes to the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying, how many people would die if we used our nuclear war plan? And Ellsberg actually thought that the military did, would not know this number. Okay? But they did. They'd already worked it out. And what came back was this graph without the annotations. Uh, and this is in his book um, that within the first uh, six months, 325 million people would die from the US nuclear war plan. But this was their plan. And then Ellsberg said, well, you know, is that just in where? And so they said, well, this doesn't include the deaths that would take place in Eastern Europe or Western Europe. And he said, no, no, so tell me those two. And so very quickly it goes from, you know, casualties within the first six months of 325 million to 600 million. When you actually say, yeah, but it's not only people in... Russia and China that would die. And it, they never included US deaths from any Russian missiles that would reach here. So in 1961, the US nuclear war plan understood that the consequence of carrying out what they were planning to do would be the death of 600 million people, at least. And so Helsberg writes, you know, what are we talking about when we're talking about 100 holocausts? That this is our military plan. Um, but it was the military plan and it wasn't undone, even though Kennedy saw this, this chart. If anything, the number of nuclear weapons went up. One of the things that wasn't included in the consequences of nuclear war plan that they talked about was the effect of fire. What they had done was to include only the effects of blast and uh, immediate heat and immediate radiation rather than what happens when you set cities on fire. The US military historically has believed that prediction of fire effects shouldn't be included in nuclear weapon consequence calculations and therefore not in nuclear war planning because it, it is more uncertain than the certainty you have about blowing up buildings with shock waves from explosions, because you can measure that and calibrate it. No one ever deliberately set a city on fire to measure exactly, but they did lots of nuclear weapon tests at the nuclear weapon test site, blowing specific things up so they know exactly how much shock wave pressure actually destroys what. And so Lynn Eden, in this amazing book called Whole World on Fire, documents this history of how fire effects were deliberately excluded from US nuclear war planning. And therefore, the consequence calculations were off. Because when you actually include them, what you get is uh, a very different insight about the scale of nuclear weapon effects, and which we tried to show in this graphic. So the, the central circle here is basically the Hiroshima-sized explosion. The next one is what a modern nuclear weapon would do um, by blast. And so that's what the war plan would have included. But when you include the effect of fire, which is the larger outer ring, you see that the scale of destruction is much, much larger. In, in effect, 
Nu modern thermonuclear weapons used against cities are basically giant firebombs. Right? And when you then have to think about how to include the populations and structures in those much larger areas, then the consequence calculations take a, a, a very different scale of effect. And so far, at least, it has still not been possible to get clear and ambiguous confirmation that current war plans actually include the full consequence of the effects of the nuclear weapons that are included. So independent experts have tried to do some of this. Um, and so this is the most recent calculation that was published this month uh, in uh, Science Advances by uh, Brian Toon and his colleagues looking at nuclear war in South Asia. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, India and Pakistan have about 150 nuclear weapons each now, and they're projected to have on the order of 200, 250 nuclear weapons over the next decade. Um, and so what they did was that they looked at specific nuclear paths to nuclear war, and they looked at, you know, different kinds of weapons that they might use, and therefore how many people would die uh, in different kinds of circumstances. And so they calculated using population uh, databases, targets, and, and paths to war, that uh, casualties you know, in India and Pakistan you know, could range between the tens and you know, in excess of 100 million people in the case of India, depending on um, if you're counting deaths or casualties, if you're counting, if you assume they use only a few nuclear weapons or much larger number of nuclear weapons. Um, but they're all calculations that are actually fairly robust given what we know about Indian and Pakistani nuclear weapons capabilities and numbers. And so this is um, small in comparison to what a US-Russian nuclear war would look like, or nuclear war between China and the United States or others because those other states have much larger nuclear weapons and, and at least twice as many uh, nuclear weapons uh, right now. But they also tried to include the effect of fire. And so uh, this is a research agenda that's been there since the 1980s. Um, but what they did was to look specifically at um, the global effects from burning cities using uh, nuclear weapons. And so if you have a target list, uh, you can estimate how much smoke you produce by setting a city on fire using a nuclear weapon. And the answer that they get is that in the kind of war plans that they modeled, you'd get between 5 and 35 teragrams of smoke and soot from burning cities in India and Pakistan, depending on the yield, depending on the number of targets and so on. But I took these images from uh, an earlier study they did with smaller weapons just to illustrate the scale and timing of this effect. So the nuclear war breaks out between Pakistan and India, and within five days you have a cloud that covers you know, a large part of that region of the world. But by day 49, in other words, you know, it's less than two months, you've basically covered the whole world with a cloud of smoke that is in the stratosphere. And so it's not going to come back down in rain. Um, and one of the, the effects that you see are from the reduction in sunlight reaching the Earth's surface because of this um, black carbon in the stratosphere. Because the sunlight has come down, the temperature goes down, and you also get large-scale destruction of ozone, so much more UV also comes through. And all three of these things have potentially catastrophic effects on all kinds of biological systems, whether it's agriculture systems or natural uh, biosystems. So, you know, two months and basically the whole world is, is in shadow. And they try and model using climate change models what happens to uh, temperature, precipitation, the biospheric primary production, as they call it. And so their most recent models using a variety of climate change models is that it would take a decade or so f in the particular war situation that they looked at uh, for the temperature to return to normal. That's about the time it takes for the smoke to begin to clear out and then for the sunlight to come back through and therefore for the surface temperatures to go back up. But by year two of this decade, of where the temperature is starting to come back up, the temperature anomaly that they calculate for the world, you see that you know uh, it's of the order of minus five to minus ten degrees centigrade over large parts of the northern hemisphere. Right? 
Um, and there are predicted loss changes in global precipitation that falls between 15 and 30 percent. So, you know, massive problems with rainfall and much colder and the effects on agriculture would be potentially catastrophic. Um, and one of the things they're trying to do now is to understand what this might mean to world food supply among, among other kinds of things, because we have no way of knowing how world food systems would actually cope with a shock on this scale and of this duration. Um, but despite all of this, um, the, all the nuclear weapon states, um, including Britain, are involved in large-scale, long-term modernization of currently existing nuclear arsenals. So, you know, despite the fact that the Cold War ended in 1990, we are not turning the corner away from these. And so all of them are developing, replacing, modernizing uh, their, both the delivery systems, the submarines, bombers, and missiles, but also the warheads that would go on them. And in the case of the US, it's expected to cost $1.7 trillion over 30 years. Um, but you know, Israel, India, Pakistan, DPRK are still, you know, to some extent, building up um, or main, committed to maintaining their nuclear arsenals. And there are also, as we've seen in the case of the US and Russia, new programs emerging for new kinds of nuclear weapons capabilities. So it's not just about replacing the old with newer versions of the same. New capabilities are being pursued. The US is developing a low yield nuclear weapon, which is specifically designed for the purpose of being able to use them without causing large numbers of civilian casualties so that people aren't outraged. Um, and both to go on submarines and uh, ground launch cruise missiles and Russia, as many people will have followed, this makes much more news um, with these hypersonic uh, missile systems and nuclear armed torpedoes that they're trying to uh, bring into uh, deployment um, to create new kinds of capabilities uh, for themselves into the future. And if you think about the time scale of some of these programs, what you see is that you know they're planning over you know this chart takes you out to fiscal year 2045 that this is how much money we're going to be spending on what particular so the new ballistic missile warhead you know is supposed to start first production unit is kind of 2041 right so the plan in the u.s nuclear weapons complex is that in 2041 we will be producing the new warhead for these missiles and so that's how far out this planning goes and by the time it's ready um, it'll be in service for at least 40 or 50 years after that and so we see commitments basically that will take nuclear weapons to the end of the 21st century if these modernization programs go ahead so to wind up along with knowing what we're doing and doing it anyway and knowing that the scale of the consequences uh, are catastrophically uh, are catastrophic uh, there are commitments to nuclear modernization in other words we'll live with this um, what process what progress was made in trying to manage nuclear weapons dangers and uh, cooperate on reducing and stabilizing the risk have which were set up uh, during the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, etc., um, limiting the number of U.S. and Soviet and then U.S. and nuclear weapons uh, and slowly bringing the numbers down um, have basically run out of steam. Um, if you look at each of the reductions that have taken place um, in the last several U.S.-Russian arms control agreements, uh, each reduction has been smaller. So in that sense, it does have an asymptotic uh, nature to it that you know each cut is a little bit smaller and therefore the process of getting to zero stretches out indefinitely far into the future and the only remaining US Russian arms control treaty that caps the number of deployed nuclear weapons is set to expire in 2021 and this has caused a lot of uh, uh, concern about whether it will either be replaced or extended because these very little enthusiasm right now in Washington, D.C. Uh, to find a new arms control treaty with Russia or to extend this current one that expires in 2021. Um, the, high, the, the high point, so to speak, um, of thinking about how to get to nuclear disarmament, if you had to put a date on it and a process and a time, I would say it was in 2010. Okay? 
when the countries of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty met in New York and they agreed a 64-point action plan. I mean, if it's got 64 points, it means there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done. Um, but only 22 of those actions actually covered nuclear disarmament, and they were very categorical in what they said. They said, look, we're all going to commit to, commit to pursue policies with the objective of achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Right? I mean, this is a year after Obama's Prague speech, you know, so here we are. And that states need to make special efforts to establish the framework to achieve and maintain a world without nuclear weapons. So in terms of policy making guidance that everybody agrees, you know, 193 countries, you can't ask for more than that as a kind of declaratory statement. And the US and the nuclear weapon states in particular committed to reduce and ultimately eliminate all types of nuclear weapons through all kinds of means. And none of this has happened. Um, if anything, we have gone backwards very fast. What started off as an anomalous process of undoing arms control treaties has now turned into an avalanche. Um, so it's almost as if this is a 30-year rule. So the anti-ballistic missile treaty that the US and Soviet Union signed in 1972 to try to say we'll limit the number of nuclear weapons that we might want to build because of your defenses by not having defenses. So therefore you won't need to make as many nuclear weapons. The US withdrew in 2002. So 30 years between realization, you know, it helps to, we don't want to do this anymore. And now there is bipartisan agreement in the US and between Democrats and Republicans that we're going to keep missile defense. So there's no going back to it. The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty signed by President Reagan and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev Signed in 1987, the U.S. withdrew in 2019, so plus, you know, more or less another 30 years. And the uh, newest one that is uh, in the process of coming undone is the Open Skies Agreement that was signed in 1992. And apparently um, Donald Trump has signed a letter saying um, that the U.S. intends to withdraw. So the formal instrument of withdrawal hasn't been uh, put out, but the intention to withdraw as a policy has apparently been signed. And so, you know, it may happen next year. Um, and as I mentioned, the New START Treaty expires in 2021. There's no um, sense in Washington that uh, the Trump administration will extend this or renew it. And there is a con question now about the Comprehensive Nuclear Weapon Test Ban Treaty, which was seen as one of the great accomplishments of nuclear arms control. You know, the idea began in the 1950s that if you stop testing nuclear weapons, you might get a a handle on this problem of developing nuclear weapons indefinitely into the future. And it was uh, signed in, in 1996, but the US Senate refused to ratify it in 1999, and 20 years have passed and there is no immediate prospect of ratification. And there is now pressure from inside the United States nuclear weapons community um, and in the Trump administration to unsign it. So not only are we not going to ratify it, we should now unsign it so we can resume nuclear weapon testing. And in a very small note in the 2018 US government document that talks about managing their nuclear weapons, they actually say that, you know, well, we could, we should have the capability to test within six to 10 months to begin new nuclear weapon testing between an order to do it and the time it takes to set up and carry it out to within six to 10 months. So funding is being allocated to speed up the process so that if the president orders the resumption of testing and former weapon scientists are now publishing articles, making the case why the US needs to resume nuclear weapon testing, saying that the last nuclear weapon test was so long ago that we need testing to make sure we still have confidence in our nuclear weapons. And you know, who knows what else we may be able to do with new kinds of nuclear weapons. And so this would open the door to basically ending the restraint on nuclear weapon testing. I mean, since 1996, when the treaty was uh, agreed and signed, only India, Pakistan, and North Korea have tested. And India and Pakistan have not tested since 1998. But if the treaty comes unstuck, we may see a whole scale return to nuclear weapon testing. So the last thing is that I did mention that there was some optimism and faced with the kind of crisis of uh, McNamara's conceivable horizon of horror, 
and the fact that promises were made to get rid of nuclear weapons that weren't carried out. Um, many of the non-nuclear weapon states have decided to take matters into their own hands. And they could have gone two ways. Right? One is that if nuclear weapons are going to be around forever, we should get some of our own. I mean, that was one path to say, okay, if this is how this is going to be done, we should make our own and we can all play this game. The other was to say, no, if you won't sign a nuclear, develop a nuclear prohibition, we will do it rather than wait for you to do it. And so what they've done is uh, taken forward the commitments they made in 2010 to that all states should try and do this. So in 2017, uh, at New York, at the United Nations, 122 countries agreed the text of a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, fulfilling the obligation under Article 1 of the UN General Assembly uh, resolution. And it's very comprehensive. It says you will not develop, test, produce, manufacture, acquire from somebody else, possess or stockpile nuclear weapons. So yeah, that's it. And it breaks new ground um, by saying that not only can you not use nuclear weapons, you can't threaten to use nuclear weapons. And this is the part that's upset the nuclear weapon states and the NATO countries in particular, that there is now a international treaty that prohibits the core idea of nuclear deterrence, that the threat of use of nuclear weapons is my national security policy that I prevent war by threatening nuclear war. And this treaty now says you are forbidden from the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, and it says for nuclear weapon states who want to join that you have to you know, do all these things about giving up your nuclear weapons in a verifiable, irreversible, time-bound plan and have safeguards in place as exist in non-weapon states to make sure you don't have secret military programs. And as of this month, um, 79 of those 122 countries have signed the treaty because it takes time between negotiating a treaty and getting your political leadership to sign it. And 33 states have actually completed their instruments of accession and ratification. And it requires 50 to enter into force. So entry into force may well be sometime next year. Um, and this then will be the new landscape of thinking about the future of the nuclear order, that there is this Magnamara's horizon of horror that you know, we all recognize that is there. The nuclear weapon states saying that we are committed to these nuclear modernization plans that will keep nuclear weapons in play for the rest of the 21st century. And this large number of non-weapon states saying that, look, you know, we also are part of the international community. And as far as we're concerned, all of these activities are to be prohibited. And this sets up a crisis of the international order, right? Because they have done this through proper process. They went to the United Nations, they got a resolution, they negotiated a treaty, they've done everything that they're supposed to do to create an internationally binding legal instrument. And so then the question is, do the nuclear weapons throw out international law and international structure and their agreements? Or do we then set up this struggle between non-weapon states and weapon states over the future of not just nuclear weapons, but world order and how we manage all kinds of collective risks. Because if this fails and if the nuclear weapon states are able to keep nuclear weapons into the foreseeable future, it becomes hard to make the case that any agreement on anything is actually possible. Because if you're not going to accept that when I do it, it's not acceptable, but when you do it, I have to accept it. The fundamental notion of reciprocity that underlies the making of law and fair process will become unraveled. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you.